So the flag came down in South Carolina, and we're going to talk about what it means to everybody in here in our area, too. Welcome into my state of mind for this Monday evening. Thank you very much for tuning in. I am Dan York. The Reverend Nikita McAllister is my guest from the uh, Calvary Baptist Church in Providence. You know, on our Friday programs, we, we, we have kind of a long-form conversation and dedicate the entire show to a specific uh, subject matter. The amnesty law, the 911 amnesty law, was the subject on Friday, and we didn't get a chance really to kind of break down the news of the day on Friday. And um, sometimes we've got to play catch-up on Monday, and we shall do that, talking about... Uh, the very profound developments in South Carolina on Friday. In the meantime, welcome in and a program notes. Know that we are on, on Fox Providence now. You know, week number two on Fox Providence at midnight, in addition to our two showings on MyRI TV at 7.30 and 11.30. So you have three chances to watch the broadcast. All right, run down, ladies and gentlemen. What was it? Boy, oh boy. If you listen to the radio show weekdays noon to 3 on WPRO today, you heard a lot of theories about what that thing was, the headline on the beach explosion. Thankfully, only one woman injured during this thing that happened, Eyewitness News, covering the event. It's been two days since the blast at Salty Brine Beach in Narragansett. Even though there's been no word yet on how or why this happened, the DEM is keeping the beach open. And the blast hasn't scared people away from coming here. By 10.30 this morning, the beach's parking lot was full. And it was a beautiful day. The beach was busy. Kathleen Denise was sitting by the jetty Saturday morning when some type of blast sent her into the air. The last thing I remember um, was reading my book. The 60-year-old woman's injuries include a concussion and broken ribs. Unbelievable. I mean, nobody knows what it is. The theories abound, and you know what? The rumors and the bad information flying all over social media. Let's just say we'll wait for the DEM, who at press time, at least this morning on the WPR News, didn't know what it was either. We certainly want to know what happened, and um, we're talking to the U.S. Geological Survey, um, the engineers who constructed the breakwater, um, because we certainly want to know what happened. Yes, yeah, so until they know what happened, they may never know what happened, but until they know what happened, you can have your own chatter about it. It was certainly entertaining at times, but it gets a little dangerous when the rumors of, well, she was having an oxygen tank, and she was smoking, and she blew herself up. Uh, they, you know, they, all that nonsense that you find on social media, just park it until they figure it out. We'll give them a few days, hopefully not a few years. Well, the Senate president on Newsmakers this particular weekend has decided that, uh, you know, she's not coming back for truck tolls. Eyewitness News and Tim White have kind of a summary over some of the provocative things that the Senate president said on Newsmakers this weekend. Last month, the governor, Senate president, and House Speaker stood below an overpass to announce a plan to pay for bridge repairs by tolling large commercial trucks. In the end, Speaker Nicholas Mattiello declined to take up the legislation passed by the Senate. Did it surprise you at all when he put the brakes on? Yes. Yes. Senate President Teresa Piva Weed calls it disappointing that the Speaker didn't support the bill. And she says she isn't interested in raising the gas tax, as Mattiello has suggested. Are there always other ways to do it? Certainly. What I would be primarily concerned about is shifting the impact to Rhode Island businesses to satisfy the National Trucking Association. Uh, Rhode Island businesses will suffer from the expense that the Rhode Island Truckers Association encumbers. Listen, we put these tolls up we're going to end up paying them, all of us, because when they don't make the nut on trucks alone, a $40 million infrastructure of gantries over 17 to 22 so-called bridges that you wouldn't even know were a bridge will be enough to say, well, we're in it this deep, we might as well hit the cars. It'll be easy pass just to get all around the state, and that'll be a disaster. My uh, suggestion is the Senate president's doing what the governor wants because she wants something from the governor. I'll explain that more in the uh, ensuing programs when I have some time. In the meantime, the House Speaker, Nick Mattiello, now has been more or less told by the Senate President, you got to match our bill because we ain't coming back. I don't know how tough she's going to be. We'll see. Yeah. Now, there are 15. Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, is in the race. Headline, can you imagine? And I guess it's going to get to 17 before we're all done. You could field both an offense and a defense on a football field with the number of candidates are almost. Uh, here's the latest on 
Well, here is the here is is his well almost cheesy announcement. America needs new, fresh leadership with big, bold ideas from outside of Washington to actually get things done. In Wisconsin, we didn't nibble around the edges. We enacted big, bold reforms, took power out of the hands of the big government special interests, and gave it to the hardworking taxpayer. People's lives are better because of it. We fought and we won. In the Republican field, there are some who are good fighters. They haven't won those battles. There are others who've won elections but haven't consistently taken on the big fights. He showed you can do both. Now I'm running for president to fight and win for the American people. Without sacrificing our principles, we won three elections in four years in a blue state. We did it by leading. Now we need to do the same thing for America. It's not too late. We can make our country great again. Join our cause and help us fight and win for America. I play the whole thing because he's a very viable candidate, but are you dizzy? I got to hold on to the table. I'm dizzy. All those trees moving in the background, that panoramic, whatever. Whoa. Uh, you know, this guy has actually been a more uh, out of the box thinking governor than his cliche ridden commercial announcement or, you know, uh, YouTube announcement would lead you to believe. He's a very viable player in this presidential race. But if they keep making them all packaged up like that, no way. In Greece, they got their own package. Finally, late yesterday, they came up with something. Time.com's headline, yeah, Marathon Talks. Have you been following this? You know, this has been a big economic save. Watch. A deal has been reached preventing Greece from a total financial collapse, and it's just in the nick of time, as Greek banks nearly run out of money. Residents were limited to withdrawing about $67 a day, but the financial institutions are now in a position to get help from the European Central Bank. No word as to what were the exact terms of the deal, but during the negotiations, Germany called on Greece to transfer billions of euros worth of state assets to an independent trust in Luxembourg out of reach of Greek politicians. The deal reached early Monday follows a large protest in Athens Sunday where demonstrators demanded an exit from the Eurozone and the strict austerity measures that a bailout would bring. Uh, they'll stay in the Eurozone and they're still going to get austerity. You can count on it. How do you dig yourself out of a $58 billion hole without austerity? So they've got some time to figure it out. Hopefully tourism dollars and economy, you know, working a little bit in that place shakes loose the opportunity to start the digging but they got a long way to go and a lot depends on it so stay tuned it's not done yet by the way uh, Greece's uh, legislative government has got to say yay to this and the Germans are not too excited about the deal and they have yet to approve it but most likely by Wednesday Thursday it'll happen and lastly uh, she didn't know what it was Headline, Miss Rhode Island is third in the Miss USA pageant. I'm not a big fan of these pageants, number one. And so I don't want to get, and I don't want to, I don't want to bust her chops. But she was asked, Anaya Garcia, uh, from Bayview, another terrific kid here locally, was asked about political correctness. And here's what she said. Here was her answer. First of all, she didn't know what it was. And so she tried to bail herself up, out by saying, um, you know, she was asked if it was helping or hurting the country, this thing called political correctness, because Jerry Seinfeld recently said something about it. And she said, I think it's a balance of both. We need the people to remind us, especially politicians, to remind us what to do and when to do wrong. Had a bad day. Here's the thing. Even though she stumbled and didn't really know what she was talking about, instinctively, she's actually speaking to what a lot of Americans think ought to happen, and that is that politicians and government ought to tell us when to go to the bathroom. That's not good. That's a problem. Your state of mind is important to us. 228-1886 is the number. Email us at stateofmind at myritv.com. Facebook post, Twitter, you know, all that kind of thing. Here's a post. I just watched your show about the Paw Sox moving. Your guest was not prepared and had no idea for the, uh, the facts. I think he should be running for a seat in the General Assembly next election. Obviously, this is a sarcastic response from Edward to uh, the gentleman who came in here from Pawtucket, uh, Mr. Norton, uh, who is, uh, listen, he's citizen advocating. He just didn't know a lot of the 
issues surrounding the actual transactional and definitions about this McCoy to 195 redevelopment land that the new Paw Sox ownership want to do for the stadium. Interestingly enough, they've got a protest and a presentation going on on that spot in Providence today as we record this broadcast for this evening. We'll reflect on that tomorrow. When we come back to South Carolina, we go, at least with the conversation. Stay with us. Pretty provocative day, don't you think? Uh, last Friday, here's the reports. Crowds cheered and chanted as the Confederate battle flag was lowered at the South Carolina State Capitol. It is a relief. 57-year-old Columbia native Francis Parker, a descendant of slaves, was among the thousands who watched the powerful moment in person. This flag is just the symbol that others use, and it perpetuates the hate. Friday's historic move ends years of controversy in the state over the divisive flag. Debate over the flag kicked into high gear last month when a gunman seen posing with the Confederate flag killed nine black parishioners at a church in Charleston. Many in South Carolina hope Friday's flag removal will be a unifying moment for the state that will bring people of all races closer together. Reverend Nikita McAllister is my guest. Welcome. Thank you. Glad I had, to be here. I had uh, erroneously said she was from Calvary Baptist Church in Providence. She's not because we had her. I thought you're not working with your husband, <laughs> who we've had here before, who runs that church. Yes. Yes, sir. So you are a married couple running two different churches. Yes, sir. Well, you know, that's good because even, even ministers really shouldn't be working together every single day, you know? I mean, they say successful marriages are about spending a little bit of time apart, even though the Lord's involved in everything, right? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you're a pleasure to have him. Thank you very much for, for coming in. What was your gut check on Friday? I was just so emotional that, and, and the fact that the flag came down, and the flag that it happened so swiftly from the incident of the shooting at the church. Um, I was very hopeful, um, I was very grateful, but I also recognized that it is a divisive symbol and that there are proponents on the other side um, who feel that it shouldn't come down. Um, but I'm glad that the state of South Carolina saw fit to remove it from the state ground. The speed with which this thing actually took on a new life, the conversation, is I think a fascinating study. Um, in evil versus good. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had other guests here to talk about this thing, and the love that poured out of the families, the victims of that church, yes. ruled the day here, didn't it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I thought that that reflected who God is. Um, the fact that God forgives, and the fact that we as humans um, hurt one another, um, hurt ourselves, but in the realm of heavenly places, God always sees fit to forgive us and let us know that He loves each one of us. So I think that's phenomenal. So you, rather than just having a you know political conversation, you know, as an ordained minister, mm -hmm. you, you've got your own, I'm sure, religion, a uh, we, well, well, theological take or, yeah. or, or you know, God relationship take here. Some folks have said that those victims became an instrument. Is that a way to just rationalize the awful, awful thing that happened there? Or how do you how do you reconcile it when you ask God why do things like this happen to, to nice to such good people who were gathered for a Wednesday prayer right. you know, prayer gathering? Uh, well, bad things happen to good people all the time, right. um, and so in terms of people wrestling with that question, that's something that we all wrestle with from time to time. You know, why did this happen to me? Um, I think at a certain level, certain people, we begin to surrender ourselves to the transcendence of God and believe that God uh, knows um, our hurts, knows our pains, and is able to heal the depth of those pains. Um, I do believe that, um, you know, the scripture says that he will turn our mourning into dancing and there will come a time where we can rejoice and embrace all of our past, which includes the good and the bad, and uh, we can see God present in it. How do you navigate this as a minister and, and a community leader and a person who's African American and feels the same challenges, uh, prejudices? How do you do that? Um, 
Well, I think it's it's navigated by the grace of God. Um, honestly, I mean, my congregation is predominantly white. So in terms of my parishioners, when the situation happened, you know, it was a prayer concern. It was things that people um, had written down as prayer concerns. We shared it as a congregation. Um, we also rejoiced in the fact that the flag came down and although it took 150 years, I think that also shows that, that God is still working in our culture and in the universe. Um, I think uh, the difficulty for humans is to say how quickly does, uh, well, whether it's vindication or how quickly um, does something happen, um, that when you look at the promises that God has made throughout the scriptures, um, there were times where it took years before they came into fruition. So it's just a matter of trusting and believing that God is still all powerful. You think the political leadership in South Carolina, Governor Haley, others, were moved by the Holy Spirit or by the polls? Well, yeah, that's an interesting debate. I, again, Does it matter? Um, at, at this point, I don't think so. I mean, in terms of, I believe that the Holy Spirit uses everyone. You know, if you look at the struggle in the Bible, you know, you have Pharaoh. Well, the word says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So even as um, harsh as Pharaoh was to the Egyptians, it was God using him as an instrument, uh, you know, to be used so that God could show the glory in that situation. So um, again, that could be debated either way, but I definitely believe that um, that God is the one who is orchestrating things in our lives. When the, when, the, when the shooting happened, I think everybody who gathers people in the church had a pause just on, you know, security logistics for heaven's sake. Absolutely. Did you, uh, did you worry? Do you I, worry? I don't. I don't worry, but I try to be um, savvy and try to be smart about it. Um, there are things, um, you know, in congregations throughout the country where, you know, people have um, security personnel on the grounds where, you know, they will look for um, individuals who do not seem to want to do um, good things to end, uh, people and they will remove those individuals. Um, you know, there have been robberies at congregations and sure. in churches. But this so, particular, but uh, this particular uh, incredibly <laughs> heinous mm -hmm. act, I, I think, had everyone at least that next Sunday thinking, oh, yeah. not here. Right. It really did, though, melt over everybody, didn't it, in terms of how just excuse the phrase, God awful this whole thing was right. and um, I hope it doesn't take that kind of event for the next steps that we still know we need to make when it comes to you know equity in the country right. but boy, I, it really took the wind out of everybody's sails and, and the forgiveness factor it's, to me, I repeat the question, it's, it was uncanny. Yeah. <laughs> and I, again, I think that's God's grace in able, enabling those individual families to be able to forgive. Um, I mean, that's the bedrock of, in a, in a way, the Christian faith. I mean, a lot of people still have problems forgiving. When you look at family structures, it's that element of forgiveness that prevents the reconciliation that needs to be, happen. But through, um, based upon my faith, you know, through the, the blood of Jesus Christ and the fact that he was that sacrificial lamb, he allows each one of us to be able to look at our lives with all of our imperfections, uh, with all of the things that we uh, do wrong and receive God's forgiveness. And I think it's, it's that gift that we're able to forgive others. And I think that's what we can take, that treasure um, that those families were able to do. Right. All is not perfect, however. We'll talk about it when we come back. To the families of the fallen, the nation shares in your grief. Our pain cuts that much deeper because it happened in a church. The church is and always has been the center of African American life. A place to call our own in a too often hostile world. A sanctuary from so many hardships. You know, that's a really interesting thing the president said. Do you agree that the, the church is the center of African American life, at least? I would agree with that statement, yes. Cultural history. You, you have a predominantly white church. Um, your husband's got a multicultural church. Right. But I'm sure you've got much background in history. Oh, growing, definitely. Growing I was reared in an African American church. Um, There's a lot of spirit, that's for sure. Yes, definitely. You know, it, you know it's. Uh, you want to, if, if, if you're feeling down, 
You go, don't go get to African African American primarily populated church, and you will walk out of there feeling pretty good. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, it's. Uh, are you able to translate that in, in, into your environment? Oh, definitely. I mean, because it's. I think part of it is um, in an African, a traditional African American context, um, you have been berated throughout the week, you know, or denigrated or discriminated in the everyday life. So having a place where you can go and be an assembly of other believers who have experienced similar things, and then find the relief and the refreshment in the Word of God to give you the energy to go back out onto. Um, "Quote unquote," the battlefield I'm, is oh, that happens. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, now that now I'm thinking, we need to schedule you for longer conversation because there are a lot of people who are watching the show thinking, really, is that, is that really the way you want to position it? That every day is kind of like a battlefield and the discrimination that African Americans face. Do you really is, is that? I can't walk in the shoes. So you tell me, it, it really feels that way day in day out for you and for. For me, well, in terms of for me, um, it's kind of the microcosm of a, a subset of a culture. So within our culture, um, racism has been ingrained very deeply. It's systemic. Um, there are things, um, as if you, when you heard the president's speech, he referred to just in terms of applying for a job, your name could dis disqualify you because of people's perception of what that entails. Um, and so there are individuals who are disregarded and not given. Um, they're perfect due because of the hue of their skin. So that is a true statement, and people do experience that, yes. I get that. Duh. I'm not saying duh to you, I'm saying mm -hmm. duh to me. But you feel like it's a grind all the time? It depends. I mean, for those um, individuals like myself who have been quote-unquote well-educated, um, who have multiple degrees and things of that nature, mm -hmm. um, it's not at the same level. But for individuals who have not received the education that they need to be able to um, change the surroundings that they're in, they have less hope. And um, the way that they reclaim that hope and they reclaim that identity is through their faith. So I think that's part of the nuance or the difference that you see in those congregations. All right. So how do you ask this question? Give me 30 seconds on where you think we are right now? Where are we? Um, I think we're at a, a very hopeful point. Um, I saw Friday as, uh, again, an experience of hope. Um, and I still think that that love that God has for all of us can happen. And when you look at Acts chapter 2, in terms of the Holy Spirit falling on all of us, it was all races, all creeds, and I think that's the best representation of God. It's all of us. We're all the body of Christ. So it shouldn't matter what our skin color is. Um, we can relate as God's creation, and I think we're a beautiful, beloved community. I'd go to church at your church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> It'd be a bonus. i got to go to Mass first. <laughs> hey, we'll take you any way you would come. <laughs> we would be happy to have it's you. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank and you. That, uh, one more thing when we come back. So how about this kid, Jordan Spieth? I mean, he comes from nowhere on Saturday to shoot 61 to win yet another tournament. Now he goes to St. Andrews. Yeah, this, this young man could very well be our next Tiger Woods. Now, whether he draws like Tiger Woods does because the stories are different, who knows. But St. Andrews is a different test. He's got to keep the ball on the ground, but we'll be watching the British Open with lots of interest this week, no doubt. Hey, uh, Mayor Bill Murray from Cumberland, as we tour the mayors this year, will be my guest tomorrow right here. And I'll see you on the radio at noontime on WPRO. Thanks for watching. Good night.